Cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and many famous diseases may just have one Achilles heel in common. They involve the simple action of one protein playing tag with another. This tiny act allows cells to talk to themselves, and when it goes wrong, diseases follow. That's why it's become one of the most important drug targets of today. So, how do we design drugs to stop this? Let's trace the journey from experiments in our labs all the way to the medicines in your pharmacy. Let's get started. Let's take a look at how your cells play this game of tag when your blood sugar runs high. The cell needs to do two things first, take in glucose and store it. So how does it do that? How does it signal itself to do that? When blood sugar runs high, insulin is released. Insulin latches onto its receptor, and this starts a game of tag. The receptor takes one of the ATP's phosphates and slaps it onto another protein, called the IRS. Once the phosphate sticker gets added, the IRS changes shape and becomes more active. And tags the next protein in line, and on and on it goes. These phosphate-adding proteins are called kinases. Think of them as the wires and switches of the cell's communication system. But here's a subtle trick that makes it more effective than it should be. Once a kinase is active, it doesn't stop tagging after just one target. It can keep going, tagging maybe 10. And if those 10 are also kinases, you end up tagging 100. Suddenly, the signal is exponentially amplified. And that's how cells turn a little tiny nudge into a powerful response. Of course, this can't run on forever. It would spiral out of control. So once the signal reaches far enough, a kinase down the line comes back and shuts down the source. Now, we've seen how signaling works. But where does the insulin signal actually go? How does it tell the cell to let glucose in and actually store it? Well, in this pathway, once the middleman kinase, called AKT, gets phosphorylated, it sets off two key branches. AKT unlatches a vesicle full of channels that only let glucose through. Once unlatched, these cute motor proteins carry them, slowly walking their little legs away to the cell's surface, where the channels get delivered and glucose gets let in, which lowers blood sugar. While that's going on, AKT also turns on enzymes that stitch glucose molecules together into glycogen, storing energy for later. All of this happens in tight coordination, like clockwork. Kinases orchestrate the timing, making sure the cells respond smoothly to a surge in sugar. They also do this through cell division, for memory formation in neurons, for immune cells launching an attack, and in short, almost every decision the cell ever makes. But the system is fragile. Even if one kinase goes out of line, disaster usually follows. Case in point, cancer. So let's look at a type of melanoma just to see how fragile this can be. This particular type of melanoma is caused by one tiny mutation, a single amino acid swapped from valine to glutamate. Sounds small, right? But this mutation rewires the entire cell. The culprit is a kinase called BRAF. It's part of the pathway that tells cells when to divide. Normally, a growth factor comes in and attaches itself to a receptor, and the receptor sends signals through kinases to trigger cell division, just like what we've seen before with insulin. But with this mutation, RAF gets stuck. It can't turn itself off, even after the growth factor goes away. The cascade keeps firing, signal keeps amplifying, and the cell doesn't know when to stop dividing. But here's the good news. This is one cancer we can treat. Remember the key ingredient to a kinase, ATP? Well, why don't we just block the ATP pocket of RAF? And that's exactly what drugs like verumafenib do. They mimic ATP just enough to sit in the binding site. But it's a dummy plug, it doesn't actually power anything. So with ATP blocked, the cascade shuts down and the cells stop dividing. Problem solved, right? We can just apply this idea to all kinases and shut them down as soon as we see them acting suspiciously. Sounds simple, 
but hear this. We have over 500 kinases in our human cells, and yet we only have 50 drugs for kinases. So why is that? Why is designing kinase drugs so difficult? So to answer this, we decided to interview a scientist from Signal Chem Biotech who actually has experience in this field. So what is this process like and why is it so difficult for someone who doesn't know what drug discovery is? Well, in most cases, kinase drug discovery is all about identifying and optimizing small molecules that can selectively bind to a kinase target and modulate its phosphorylation activity. When you go to the store, a drugstore, you would ask um, the salesperson or the pharmacist any side effects. Right? That's something we usually consider when buying a drug. So same thing, the off-target's effect can disrupt other signaling pathway, which can cause uh, unwanted effects. To see why Eric brought this up, let's return to our example. Indeed, inhibiting ATP to, from getting into kinases makes a lot of sense. Every kinase uses ATP, but that in and of itself is a double-edged sword. We have a lot of kinases. A lot of them are similar, and so there's a good chance your inhibitor works on other kinases too. Kinases that might be keeping an important signaling pipeline alive. The most reliable way to answer these questions is to experimentally determine the drug's inhibition profile across a panel of kinases. Well, a panel of kinases is um, like a group of kinases that are related to each other. Uh, for example, they have very similar ATP binding pockets, um, they have similar 3D structures, or they're co-localized in the same cellular compartment. So they can be hit by the same by the same compounds or, or, or drug. So what's really powerful about compound profiling is that it tells us so much more than just off-target effects or selectivity. Depending on how the experiments are designed, profiling can reveal how strongly a drug can hit a target, how quickly and for how long the target is engaged, the mechanism behind the inhibition, or even whether the inhibition is reversible. Um, one thing we can determine is how, is whether the, the, the compound can compete with the natural kind of substrate, for example, ATP. So we, we can design experiments to look at the competition between the, the compound and ATP. Um, and that will tell us whether the drug is actually uh, bind to the ATP binding pocket or an allosteric pocket of the kinase structure. This kind of information is incredibly valuable for guiding the uh, optimization of drug candidates. In short, I like to think uh, compound profiling as the feedback engine of drug discovery. It provides the data that informs rational decisions about which molecules to advance, tweak, or discard at every stage of kinase inhibitor development. Okay. Um, can you tell me more what happens after com compound profiling in like, kinase drug discovery, or just drug discovery in general? Well, compound profiling is actually in every stage of the drug discovery process. So there's hit discovery, hit to lead, uh, optimization, and then there is a third round of, uh, of optimization, and then there's final validation uh, with the uh, clinical samples or, or animal models. So compound profiling is involved in all of these stages. So it doesn't just, uh, you know, it's, it's not just primary screening. The, the profiling is in all the screening stages. So that's the journey from identifying the target to screening and profiling to the long march of trials before a drug ever reaches our pharmacy. Kinases are the hidden switches that let our cells think, move, and survive. When they go wrong, the results can be devastating. But when we learn to guide them, we unlock new ways to fight diseases. What do you think is like Signal Chem's contribution towards like kinase drug discoveries? Um, well, our I think the 
most significant contribution from SignaChem to the scientific com community or to the drug discovery uh, community is that uh, we have a panel of recombinant kinase products, protein products that cover uh, more than 90% of the human kinase. The tools we're building today could shape the next generation of cancer therapy, and here at SignalCom Biotech, we're honored to be part of that story. Thank you for joining us in our journey.